And my name is Brian Murphy, and I'm the manager of business development for NGS Leaders and Cambridge Health Tech Associates. Welcome all, and thanks for joining today's event. We have an excellent program for you all today. Before we begin, allow me to just share some brief background with you who may be joining us for the first time. NGS Leaders is a free online community that provides members across industry and academia with opportunities to engage in both learning and networking to advance the science of next generation sequencing and genomics. In addition to bringing you topical webinars, NGS Leaders also hosts an online discussion board, a blog, focus groups, product reviews, and also much more. So if you have not recently, be sure to spend some time on the site to check out all the ways you can engage with your peers. NGS Leaders is organized and managed by Cambridge Health Tech Associates, or CHA. And CHA is a life sciences consultancy that uses its unique collaborative model to improve the speed, economics, and effectiveness of life science research and development. CHA leverages its communities, such as NGS Leaders, as well as its consulting and technology evaluations to help clients in the industry achieve their individual goals. And as you, as you may have guessed, uh, CHA is a sister company to Cambridge Health Tech Institute, which is the leading life sciences conference and media company. Not pictured here, but in addition to NGS Leaders, uh, CHA also owns the Drug Safety Executive Council, community for professionals focused on improving patient safety and reducing compound attrition due to adverse drug effects. So feel free to visit drugsafetycouncil.org if that is of interest to you, or feel free to uh, share that with a friend. And again, membership in all CHA communities is free. As mentioned, uh, CHA also provides consulting services to the NGS sector, including market research uh, as well as business planning. Recently announced, uh, this new offering builds upon CHA's nearly decade of experience in providing consulting solutions to other life sciences domains. CHA provides forums for technology developers and the user community to, to more effectively collaborate on the evaluation of, of new NGS technologies. One forum managed by CHA is called the Technology Evaluation Consortium, which aims to collectively evaluate and qualify new life sciences tools in a manner that maximizes knowledge gained and also minimizes cost. There are currently over 10 pharmaceutical company members uh, in this technology evaluation consortium. All CHA technology evaluations are intended to help emerging companies and technologies uh, across the chasm, as they say, on the technology adoption curve, uh, which is shown here, in order to accelerate the market acceptance of new and, and useful tools. So if you have questions about any of this stuff, feel free to contact us afterwards. Okay, so, so in a moment, I will introduce today's moderator, uh, Kevin Davis. First, I'll just prompt you uh, that at the end of today's session, we will display a very brief survey. At that time, we would ask Ben just a few minutes to give us your input to help us in the planning and execution of future events. So without further ado, I'd like to introduce uh, Kevin Davis, who will be moderating today's session. Kevin is the editor-in-chief of BioIT World and is also the author of the recent book entitled The $1,000 Genome. The Revolution in DNA Sequencing and the New Era of Personalized Medicine. So I'll turn it over to Kevin now to introduce today's panelists. Kevin? Thank you, Brian. Welcome, everyone. Welcome to this NGS Leaders webinar, Approaches to Microbiome Analysis. I'm Kevin Davis, editor of BioIT World, author of The Thousand Dollar Genome. And it's a pleasure to welcome you to another um, popular, exciting NGS Leaders webinar. Today we're talking about metagenomics. We've held a number of NGS Leaders webinars over the past 12 months on a variety of topics ranging from de novo genome assembly tools to clinical genomics, but we've rather neglected this uh, very important field that I think is finally getting its due in the world of genomics. Metagenomics offers a powerful lens for viewing the microbial world that opens new doors to a tremendous amount of scientific exploration in areas from evolution to human health. Our three expert speakers today will share insights on methods for microbiome analysis. They'll discuss current challenges and advances in reference genome sequencing, as well as efforts to link the microbiome to a variety of human diseases. A little later in the program, you'll hear from Volker Meyer, a computational biologist at Argonne National Laboratory, as well as Laura Parfrey, a postdoc in Rob Knight's lab at the University of Colorado in Boulder. But first, it's a pleasure to welcome from the J. Craig Venter Institute, Barbara Methe. Barbara is a professor in the departments of human genome medicine and microbial and environmental genomics at the Venter Institute. She has a wealth of experience in metagenomics, microbial ecology, and physiology, 
handling large data sets uh, in gene expression studies and other data sets. She's a co-investigator of the Human Microbiome Project at JCVI. She leads a metagenomic project exploring links between the human microbiome and psoriasis. And she's also leading a Department of Energy-funded effort to apply functional genomics methodologies in the area of bioremediation. So lots to talk about. Barbara, it's a pleasure to welcome you to the webinar. I'm going to pass the microphone over to you. Great. Thanks so much. Great. And uh, Thanks. we'll start out today with a, a basic question. What is metagenomics? And uh, there, there are multiple ways to define this term, but you can see here on, on the slide in front of you that one way we can consider metagenomics is it's the application of genomics-based methods to study microbial communities directly from their natural environments. So in this way, we're circumventing the need for isolation and cultivation of individual species. So in this case, when we talk about metagenomics specifically, we're, we're generally referring to the generation and analysis of sequence from whole community or bulk community DNA. And sometimes this is also referred to as whole genome shotgun or WGF sequencing. So the next question we might ask is, why do we want to use metagenomic approaches in the first place? And perhaps one of the most important drivers for use of metagenomics approaches is illustrated on this slide. With our current culture techniques, we're able to isolate into culture perhaps less than 1% of the diversity in our ecosystem. So we know that microbes are ubiquitous on our planet. They're incredibly diverse. And they're, they're exquisite chemists. They're, they're capable of many forms of metabolism without which we, we could not survive on this planet. So unlocking their genetic potential is critical to not only our own survival and health, but the health and sustainability of our planet. So metagenomics allows us to apply culture-independent views to the, to the microbial world. On the next slide, another important driver for using metagenomics approaches is the fact that microbes rarely live in isolation. They live and interact in community, whether these are communities that are associated with the human body, such as the human microbiome, or diverse environments around the world. So this could be a, a hot spring, it could be the ocean, it could be soil, fresh water, and so on. And this next slide is just a reminder that while we very often focus on bacteria and archaea when we, when we talk about microbial communities, we should not forget that viruses and the, the pico and micro eukaryotes are also very important members oftentimes of these communities. And there's a lot of interactions that occur between viruses, bacteria, and microeukaryotes. And so metagenomic approaches provide us a, a, with a way to begin to view the nature and extent of these complete communities. This slide is meant to introduce the concept of metaomic approaches and their integration into the concept that's sometimes known as systems biology. Again, this, this is the idea that we're investigating whole microbial communities, and this can be done in a variety of ways. A few of the more popular methods are illustrated here on this slide. So we have metagenomics, which is the study of microbial community DNA. So in this case, we're looking at genetic potential. What might this community be capable of doing? Here we can move into examining the function of communities by looking at, for example, gene expression through the investigation of the RNA transcribed from genes. Next, we can consider the proteins that are translated from the RNA using uh, techniques, metaproteomic techniques. And then there are other approaches as well, such as examining the metabolites produced by the community using uh, metabolomic approaches. So ideally, if we can use all of these techniques, and integrate these layers of complex information, we can gain a true picture of not only what the community members, who is there, and what they might be capable of, but what they're actually doing under particular sets of conditions. Of course, as, as indicated, these techniques are computationally heavy, and good in bioinformatics is important for analysis. And although we're not really discussing um, this topic at any length today, don't forget about your study design, 
the method of sample collection and, and preparation that goes into obtaining this data. This is absolutely critical to the success of what you can achieve downstream, and that success is going to depend very much on your study design, your sample collection, and, and preparation to obtain data from these various approaches. D due to time constraints, in the remainder of this talk, we'll focus on metagenomics. So again, this is sequencing of bulk community DNA, and here we're really looking at genetic potential. Um, the discussions of the other omics approaches that I introduced are really complete topics in and of themselves. So a major driver of metagenomics, which is opening up this field more and more, is the advent of so-called next generation sequencing, which I'm sure many of you are all very familiar with. So we started out for a long time with Sanger sequencing, and then we, then we started to get new platforms. First we had 454 Pyro sequencing, and then this was followed by many other platforms such as Illumina and Solid, and the, the list continues to grow, and the number of platforms that are available are, are only going to continue to grow. So in considering what technologies are best for your project, the, the answer is going to depend on a number of factors. In part, it might be practical availability. You know, perhaps you have one of these instruments in-house, but also the nature of the study that you're doing and the questions you wish to answer. And I would say a caveat in considering each of these platforms is to remember that they're all different. You know, they, they all give nucleotide sequence. However, each has different characteristics, especially in terms of the error rates and the error profiles. That, in other words, the kinds of errors that will, will tend to be introduced into sequences. And this is especially important to think about for uh, metagenomics because oftentimes we're looking at individual reads, so effectively 1x coverage for information. Oftentimes we don't have deep coverage uh, of, a, of a particular uh, gene or, or sequence. And therefore, any errors in that sequencing read come with you into your analysis. O on the plus side of next generation sequencing is the fact that you know, we can more inexpensively obtain greater amounts of sequence data, let's say, compared to the, to the Sanger days. And uh, oftentimes, this means that we, we have the ability to consider in our study design the ability to introduce greater depth and greater breadth in terms of sample numbers and, and, and replication into study design. And so this is, this is a great plus for studying microbial communities. However, although the sequencing may be getting less expensive, the analysis is not. And this is a place where there's much work and evolution of techniques uh, taking place currently to, to try to handle these challenges. So let's consider further a, a few of the most important challenges in uh, metagenomic investigations. And among these are the fact that the, the sequence you're going to get back, it's fragmentary. You don't know uh, what the source of the organism is. You're going to get a mixture of sequence from different organisms. So you're going to have different GC compositions. You're going to have different codon usage biases and so forth. You also need to consider the fact that when it, if you're uh, calling genes, so open reading frames or genes from your, from your data, the, the kind of gene finders that have been used typically for complete genomes are generally are not as good and applicable. You want to use a gene caller that's capable of calling a partial open reading frame because oftentimes that's what you're able to obtain from your metagenomic data. Considering um, more informatics and analysis challenges, uh, there's a number of challenges related to assembly because you will, what you'll tend to find in most of your genomic data is that you have very different levels of representation of different organisms. So you'll tend to find certain organisms are going to be very abundant. You're going to have many reads from those organisms, and you're going to have others where you have far less coverage. There can be a number of genomic regions that are highly conserved, even among very distantly related organisms. So that can be a challenge for, for assemblers. Uh, you'll also find that there can be considerable genomic variation between closely related organisms. And so this polymorphism between related community members may lead to incorrect estimations of the repeat structures. 
and repetitive sequence within individual genomes is always a, a, a challenge for assembly. And oftentimes, even when you've assembled data, you will have a number of reads that do not assemble. And so, again, you're dealing with what's considered 1x coverage. You have a single read representing a gene. And so, again, that, that as I mentioned previously, this, you know, sequence error and rates of, of error uh, matter very much in, in this kind of, in this milieu. And of course, the volume of metagenomic sequencing is just vastly increasing. We're able to generate more and more of it. Another thought um, to take into consideration, particularly if you're doing some form of microbiome sequencing where you're looking at associations of microbial communities with plants, animals, humans, you need to factor in the amount of potential host contamination that you might have in your sample. So if you're taking a, a sample from a human, for example, you may very well get human sequence in that sample. And you want to, you're going to need to consider filtering to remove that sequence from your, meta, your metagenomic analysis. And it's also going to use up some of the uh, sequence depth that you devoted to that sample. So you need to take that into consideration as well. In designing any analysis strategy, typically the, the two fundamental questions that any researcher wants to address with metagenomics is who is there and what are they doing? And typically many of the analyses are centered around these, these two overarching questions. And there's a number of ways to answer these questions and we'll be hearing more about some of those techniques today. So what I'll do here is to provide an overview of some of the more common approaches. However, I will say that, you know, there is no one-size-fits-all answer for metagenomic analysis. It does depend greatly on the questions that you have for your particular study, and you should realize that the tools and techniques are continuing to evolve. So you certainly want to stay abreast of, of those changes because there is a lot of rapid development occurring in this area. Here we'll, on this slide, we'll discuss some uh, common approaches. And we, we have options with metagenomic data to work with both read-based data, so unassembled data, and to work with assembled data. And oftentimes, the various bioinformatics approaches will be applied to both of these data sets. So if we start at 12 o'clock on the circle and move clockwise, um, we can see that after we've done quality control filtering of the sequence data, oftentimes the next step is to provide some kind of basic annotation or curation of the metagenomic sequence data. And this typically includes identification of non-coding features, so ribosomal RNAs, tRNAs, and so forth, as well as the coding features, so the open reading frames, the genes. Typically, we want to identify putative functions of these genes and place them into metabolic pathways. And this is typically done using a series of searches, which are oftentimes based on, on similarity. So probably all of you are familiar with BLAST, and there's a number of BLAST and other kinds of, of similarity-based searches, and also searches to a hidden Markov model profiles. We use these a lot for high throughput annotation. These are highly curated profiles that are statistical representations of a consensus sequence of a protein family. And typically, if you um, have a hit above what's called a trusted cutoff to a hidden Markov model, that's usually a very good annotation. But there's also a number of clustering routines that can be applied to group sequences into protein families, and that's oftentimes used particularly in metagenomics, because very often you're, you're discovering novel families that are not in the database, and so you don't necessarily have a way of annotating them, but you can group them into protein families. In addition to addressing function, we also want to assign uh, taxonomic classifications to our reads or assemblies, and this can be done using similarity type approaches and phylogenetic approaches in which the evolutionary basis for taxonomic assignment is considered. Very important for metagenomic work is oftentimes to include mapping of the metagenomic sequence to reference genomes. And this is a very useful way for annotation and analyzing data. So this points out the fact that having good reference genomes that represent the environment that you're investigating are critical to metagenomic analysis. 
Next, we can consider a, a variety of assembly algorithms to attempt to assemble sequence reads into longer and longer contiguous sequence. This is especially useful for data reduction. So as you move from many individual reads to a consensus sequence, you can reduce your data. And of course, the longer sequence is also much better for gene calling and annotation. However, again, as I uh, indicated before, sometimes it's just not possible to assemble all of, and in fact, very often in metagenomic data, it's not possible to assemble all of it. The arrow in the, in the circle here is simply meant to r remind everyone that, of course, we can use both read-based and assembly-based approaches for many of these topics that, I, that I've been talking about. Next, we, we often have multiple samples that we wish to compare our taxonomic and functional profiles to. And so we need to have ways of comparing metagenomic data, and I'll be talking about some tools for that uh, a little bit later in the talk. And of course, we want to uh, be able to link our sequence information to any sample metadata that we have. And having good metadata describing your whatever your sample is, whatever your environment is that you're looking at, is incredibly important because this is going to help to place your results in, into a broader context. I would also take a moment here to emphasize don't forget about provenance tracking. So not only the metadata of your sample, but also the various methods that, that you use for analyzing your, your data. We certainly need to have the ability to ask various questions that are specific to the needs of any particular study. And so to do this, I'm going to briefly introduce a tool that we've been working on here at, J, at the JCVI that's meant to facilitate metagenomic comparative analysis, and it's called MetaRep. And the data that I'll use for these examples was generated as part of the uh, Human Microbiome Project, uh, which was funded by the NIH. And I'll just briefly uh, introduce, that, introduce that project to you now. So just considering very briefly, we're more, in, a, in effect, we're, we're more bacteria than we are human, at least in terms of the, the, uh, the collective membership of the the abundance of, of bacterial versus human cells. And so sometimes this is, you know, considered, a, a, you know, we're considered a superorganism, this collection of who we are as human and our microbial component. And so the HMP was designed to produce a, a framework of the human microbiome from healthy adults. And of course, interest in the human microbiome is rapidly developing and with the advancements in, in next-gen sequencing and metagenomics, we're gaining new, new approaches to now investigating these important relationships between the human host and the human microbiome, many of which are poorly understood. Here, this is um, just a, a quick overview of the NIH-funded Human Microbiome Project. It has a number of components to it, and I just want to point out two that are of particular importance, and that's the production of metagenomic sequence of the microbiome, and um, that, that's down, down at the bottom of, of the circle where you see metagenomic data sets. So the idea here was to look at over 250 um, healthy humans from diverse body sites and to sequence using uh, metagenomic approaches to sequence their microbiomes. And then this is being supported by a large initiative to complete relevant reference genomes associated with the human body. And so that's at the top of the circle where you see the goal here is to produce uh, approximately 3,000 reference genomes. And so again, as I mentioned before, having good reference genomes is incredibly important to being able to facilitate metagenomic analysis. And, and these two components work synergistically. So then just very briefly, I'm going to introduce metagenomic, comparative metagenomic tool that I mentioned called MetaRep. This is an open source tool that's available to the community. And very simply, it will take in various forms of annotation. Here I have illustrated our metagenomics annotation pipeline, but it's agnostic really to where the annotation comes from. And it's a very simple format in terms of the uh, data structure for importing data into MetaRep. So you take sequences from your samples, you uh, get your output 
from your metagenomic annotation, and that becomes the, the grist or the input into MetaRap. And here we can just see a, a high-level view showing some screenshots of MetaRap output. So you can start at a very high level looking at um, individual samples and continue to drill down into your data. And then you can not only look at the taxonomic and functional profiles of individual samples, but you can also begin to look at them in groups. So you can include or exclude different data samples and features that you want to examine. Since we make use of an S a MySQL database, you can write customized queries for information, and we incorporate the R statistical package, so there's many statistical routines that can be applied to your data. I will just simply, this will only take a minute to just wrap up here, to go through just three quick examples using a particular data set from the HMP of about 500 samples from 100 individuals representing about 14.5 uh, trillion reads. And I'll just point out that we are standing up a dedicated instance of this data set, and you can see the URL there, and that will be live um, shortly. So that you can go yourself and look at this tool, and you can um, look at the HMP data for your own comparative analysis if you want to. So, for example, we can examine taxonomic relationships between body habitats using functional genes. So here's an example in which we're looking at the distribution and abundance of uh, pyruvate ferredoxin oxidoreductase across various body sites. And we can see, for example, organisms such as the, the Crenarchaeota, which are not um, abundant in, in the human microbiome, but we can see, for example, if you look um, at the skin samples, they, they make a rather large um, contribution there to the skin sample. We can also examine variation of, of taxonomy and pathway composition within uh, individual samples across body ha habitats and, and donors. And so that's shown here on this next slide, where on the left-hand side, we're looking at clustering of samples based on taxonomy. And on the right-hand side, we're looking at clustering based on uh, function and we can compare those uh, different results. And then in the third example, we can apply different kinds of statistical tests. In this case, we're applying the Wilcox and Ranksum test and a metastats test, which is a modified uh, non-parametric t-test. And we're going to compare three different sites in the human body, the, uh, the cheek, the surface of the tongue, and, the pla and plaque from your teeth. And we can look at different distributions uh, and abundance of pathway and look for statistically significant differences, which are indicated on the table on this slide. And we can look at what are those particular pathways that show statistically significant differences. And so, for example, I've pulled out a few of them here in this table, and we see differences in, in uh, functions such as antibiotic synthesis, functions related to pathogenesis, and to end glycan biosynthesis. And so in this way, we can begin to understand what are similarities and differences in metabolic function between different habitats in the human body. And so I'm coming right to the end here, so I'm simply going to uh, come to my acknowledgement slide. There are several URLs on the uh, lower right-hand corner of the slide where you can find out more information about the Human Microbiome Project, and also, if you're interested in looking further into the uh, MetaRep tool, you can go to that link and various information and ways that you can begin to work with the tool and, and apply your own investigations. And so with that, I'm going to stop there. I'm going to turn the mic back to uh, Kevin and uh, to our other speakers. And thank you very much for your time and attention. Barbara, thanks very much. Great way to uh, get, the, uh, get the webcast started. I'm going to uh, save questions. We have, we've had several come in already. Thank you for those. Keep them coming. We will try to get to as many of those as we can at the end of the three presentations. But for now, I'm going to bring in our second speaker. And it's a pleasure to welcome in Volker Meyer, who is a computational biologist at Argonne National Laboratory in Illinois. He's also a senior fellow at the Computation Institute at the University of Chicago uh, and associate division director of the Institute of Genomics and Systems Biology. His current work focuses primarily on the analysis of shotgun metagenomic data sets and on the MGRAS community resource for metagenomics. And so Falk is going to tell us what a, a good, hardworking computational biologist is doing in this uh, wonderful world of microbiome data. Falker, welcome.
So hi everybody, thanks for the introduction. So I'm going to talk about some of the challenges involved in doing metagenomics and I think Barb did a great introduction to some of the more biological aspects. Let me focus on the informatics and I should maybe explain that the reason I'm doing this is that I'm involved deeply with the MGRAS project. MGRAS is one of the more frequently used metagenomics resources. Uh, in fact, we've uh, analyzed over 45,000 metagenomics data sets. And uh, I'm very pleased to report that we very recently actually hit 13 terabases of data analyzed, which I believe is a major feat. And I'm putting the URL right here uh, on the screen. Uh, and I'll, I'll get to MGRAS at the very end of the talk. So what I chose to talk about today is the Earth Microbiome Project and illustrate the challenges in the context of the uh, Earth Microbiome Project. There, there's a specific reason for that, which I think will become apparent. Let me quickly try and explain what the Earth Microbiome Project, so this is not the Human Microbiome Project, it's the Earth Microbiome Project, or short EMP is. And I think the best description really is, is a quote from Julian Davis from uh, Canada. Uh, who says that you know if we, if we do something like the Earth Microbiome Project, provide a catalog of microbial diversity on the planet, it'll look other disciplines rather pitiful. And I, I really like that quote. So let me give you uh, some more ideas what the Earth Microbiome Project really is and why I think it's, it's one of the coolest projects throughout these days. So first of all, we have a beautiful logo. That's a very good reason to like the project, but maybe not sufficient. Um, what we are doing, trying to do here, and, and, and I'll explain also who we are, is to provide a systematic approach to, to characterizing microbial life. So we're not going square kilometer to square kilometer or something like that. We are trying to look at environmental gradients and, and sort of look at the environment the way the micro. And what we're trying to do is design sort of ideal strategies to interrogate these, these biomes. We're doing that by both collecting Amplicon data, um, that is 16F Amplicon most of the time, shotgun data, and messenger RNA data, and using all the appropriate tools. And uh, so basically, uh, an approach or the approach is outlined in, in uh, Jack Gilbert's paper that was published in Standard and Genomic Science uh, not too long ago. The EMP will deliver a number of data products to the world. Uh, one of them is a, it's, we hope, will be a gene atlas, and we're actually pretty sure we can do that that will be uh, containing a comprehensive atlas of sequence information from uh, metadata uh, meta around the planet. We will also attempt to assemble genomes from uh, the metagenomic uh, sequencing. And there, there are a number of uh, cases where this has been done, some of them published, some of them unpublished. With the amount of sequencing that we are uh, contemplating to do in the context of the uh, Earth Microbiome Project, and of course also the sequencing has already started, I should mention that, we believe that we can uh, by far uh, outreach what has been achieved by a clonal sequencing or a culture-based sequencing, as so nicely illustrated by Barb earlier on. In addition to the to these genomes and the, and the individual genes and proteins, we will also provide metabolic reconstruction using existing technologies for, re, uh, for rebuilding metabolic networks from both the metagenomes and the new, new uh, organisms or organismal genomes that we will create. And, and finally, the whole thing will be tied together by a visualization portal. We're hoping it'll be uh, something like that it can be tied into Google Earth and be very user-friendly. And this is all sort of the outline of the project. There's outline. parts already being undertaken, and I will point out where the challenges are for, for the work currently. Uh, by the way, this is just, uh, just in order to mention that. We are estimating at this point that we will need about 2.4 petabases of sequence. This, this, right now, this is equivalent to 8,000 high seek 2,000 runs. So that, that's definitely going to be one of the big challenges, getting uh, the funding together. Right now, we're crowdsourcing most of the uh, resources to do that, and industry has been helping there. Another challenge will be setting up a database of samples, although there we're already making uh, tremendous progress. So Barb mentioned study design, uh, and also I think she mentioned provenance and, and sort of uh, metadata. I think it's very important that we consider experiment of that magnitude, we really need to uh, collect all of the environmental data and also uh, collect that all in the database to allow us to have a rational design for which of the samples are going to be sequenced at what depth. And speaking of sequencing, and I think this is also tying into what Barb said earlier, we need standardization for sampling, sample prep, and sample processing. Not to the extent that we will force somebody who works in, say, a soil environment to use the same prep methods that are suitable for aquatic methods, uh, aquatic systems, but certainly to the extent that we are not comparing apples and oranges. And, and right now within the EMP, the groups of Rob and I, Jack Gilbert and Jenna Jensen are working on finding ways to standardize within specific biomes to ensure that we actually are not comparing apples and oranges. And this is actually working. And I think for the first time in biology, what we're seeing here is that we need a standardization and also a, a versioning of, of approaches. 
so that you know you can say I use the EMP protocol for soil version one, and this is my result, and this is how it compares to version two. This is going to be something that we will have to figure out later. Again, this is right now a volunteer effort. Uh, there is no sort of large-scale funding for this. We already have, I think, sequenced more than 50,000 data sets. Uh, most of those for 60 nets already uh, only, but uh, metagenomics is, is following. But the coordination is one of the other big challenges, and also collecting all the data in, in one place. So since so this is a big project, and I'm talking about lots of people's work, let me briefly show you who the people are and who are the institutions that are involved. In fact, this is an old slide. We have now over 70 institutions that are uh, working in the context of this, uh, this project. Uh, quite a few of them actually are bringing their own sequencing, just using EMP standards to, to, to push uh, sort of their data out to the world to allow comparison. And I think the one big, or maybe the only limitation that the EMP at this time has is we're requiring that all your data is made public at the time of sequencing immediately. Other than that, there, there are very little limitations. You can just join, and, and you can definitely join by sending either me or Jack Gilbert an email, and we will forward that to the rest of the EMP. And I did show the, uh, the home page for the project, uh, Earth Microbiome Project. If you, if you Google, you will easily find that. So, um, by the way, I should mention, this is a photo of Jack Gilbert, who's spearheading the uh, EMP at this time. And I think I should also mention that none of the work we are doing in the context of the EMP actually would be possible without the work of the Genomic Standards Consortium, GSC, who are providing the framework for reporting the metadata and the provenance information. And I think it's important that we recognize that, that this is far more important than, than we ever thought it might be in the time, what we had thought in the past it might be. So the way I think of the EMP is really it's a distributed sequencing effort with standardized procedures. In a way, we are replacing big sequencing centers by a distributed sequencing effort. But we are, in a way, centralizing the generation of some of the data products to ensure that scientists will all the work and compare stuff. And I think, as Bart mentioned, it's really important that you know we, we, we are cognizant of the challenges that are happening. And uh, uh, we are sort of getting the right bioinformatics in place to, to tackle the bioinformatics and not be comparing apples and oranges. And I'm, I'm telling this story now from out the perspective of somebody running MGRAS here or else here right now. I'll show it to you later again. One of the things that Bob mentioned was the different levels of quality for different sequences. And this is certainly something that we've seen a lot in the context of MGRAS. You know, when, when we started seeing data sets coming in from, from many, many sources, I think we have about 7,000 people submitting data to MGRAS at this point. One of the questions we get asked a lot by, by our sort of users is, how trustworthy is my data? And a, a sort of a reminder for those that maybe even new info for those that are new to the field, there was a debate not too long ago that has been named, has been uh, referred to as the rare biosphere debate, where what happened is uh, the sequence uh, information may be a bit noisier than people expected at the time. And this led to an overestimation of the uh, size of the rare biosphere. And of course, these days, people that are working in 16 s amplicon analysis are routinely denoising their data, and they're also finding that denoising. It's computationally very expensive and difficult to do, but of course, if you denoise your data, uh, what happens is the, the estimates of diversity are going down rather dramatically, and people find that these new estimates are much more correct than they were in the past. So the, the big problem, I think, that whole uh, metagenome shotgun uh, is facing is that there are no tools like denoising for shotgun data. Barb referred to assembly. Assembly is, is one tool that will allow you to not only reduce uh, the volume of data dramatically, it will also allow you to uh, to go ahead and uh, increase the quality of your of your uh, assembled sequences. There is a downside, however, because assembly tools that exist today were, with very few exceptions, built for uh, clonal genomes, and they are not built for a situation where we have multiple species maybe even with a lot of uh, strain variation in there uh, at different levels of abundance. So most assemblers that we are familiar with actually uh, generate a huge bias in the data that they assemble. And uh, I'm one of those people that uh, believes assembly has to be taken with a grain of salt and we're very careful to use assembly. We're actually studying the artifacts introduced by assembly. But this is not the point to talk about that. Let's talk about QC, uh, QC approaches, quality control approaches uh, that are uh, available for, for metagenomics data. So what we could do is we could use reference sequences, which is, of course, uh, nicely done if you're doing something like resequencing. For metagenomics, it's a bit problematic because, as Barb said, only 1% of the species are known. So uh, we would be ending up uh, you know, use, having quality control for 1% of our sequences, where the rest is actually the interesting part. So that isn't, doesn't look like it's very suitable. An alternative could be to use the vendor-specific scores. For example, most sequencing platforms these days provide FRED scores. 
threat scores are, uh, of course, linked to the old days of Sanger sequencing. They're not really suitable for, for a higher next generation sequencing instruments. And also, these are vendor provided scores. We have no real need of ver need to verify the whether verifying whether a vendor might be um, they're reporting slightly better quality than the sequence data merits in order to sort of make their platform look good. So for the EMP, we really need something that will allow us to, to go across vendor boundaries and give us an independent estimate of quality control. And fortunately, one of my postdocs, this photo is on the screen, Kevin Keegan, uh, he found a very nice approach to doing that. Uh, he's looking at artifacts of sequencing and library preparation. And uh, those artifacts allow us to um, identify sequences that are, that are identical. So what is happening in, in sequencing, uh, frequently people use the PCR step. And all the PCR steps that are known to me, this has actually been published by Tom Schmidt and ISMI in, I think, 2009. What happens is uh, frequently you get artificial duplicate reads. So a, a given stretch of DNA gets basically copied once during the library creation, and you end up with a duplication. Many people who've done metagenomics are familiar with that. Traditionally, and it's also true for MGRAS, we remove these duplicates. They're very easy to find. And what Kevin thought of is, hey, since we can find those exact duplicates, how about we look for inexact duplicates? How about we look for uh, situations where we find a sequence and then what actually uh, happened is they're not 100% exact, exact duplicates of each other. They're, there's a slight variation. And if we can measure this variation, can we use this as a means to uh, assay the quality of the, the sequencing and the library preparation? And will that inform our ability to an analyze the sequence downstream? And this has uh, been accepted in post computational biology. The method is called DRIC, duplicate read inferred sequence error estimation. And if we do that, and, and this is very interesting because it also is compared to the spread scores, the more traditional ways of, of uh, looking at errors, showing you four randomly selected but quite typical examples here. Note that in blue we have the uh, error in FRET over the, uh, the various bases. So these are 100, bases, 100 base pair reads. This is summarized over all the reads in a given library, so typically millions of reads. And what we can see here is that we have an error of, I would say, about 1% reported by FRET for this data set at 100 bases, and it's lower at the competing bases, which is reasonably good, I would say. Surprisingly enough, looking at the, uh, the error uh, within the duplicates, and uh, we only identify duplicates that have at least the first 50 base pairs uh, identity, uh, this is a technical restriction of the algorithm. We could certainly change that, but we see there is a rather large gap between what Fred reports and what uh, Dreesey reports. Although in general they tend to agree here, uh, we can see that in this other data set to our right, another 100 base pair data set. This is again basically the same is happening, although our error estimates with Dreesey are a bit higher. Uh, so these two data sets I would actually refer to as rather good, although the error at 100 bases is, uh, in our estimates, close to 5% or even higher than 5%. These are not data sets that I would be concerned about. Data sets I would be concerned about are data sets like those shown in the bottom half of my screen, where uh, the error estimates by FRED, excuse me, are actually going up quite a bit. But the error estimates that we see by looking at, again, the sets of duplicate reads, I'm sorry, these are the exact duplicate reads. These are products of the PCR reaction. So a piece of DNA at the beginning of the sequencing reaction was actually copied. And we can see variation at the very end of the sequencing reaction. And if you see variation up to 25%, that is actually rather staggering. But also going down to 70 bases, there's a 10% chance of error. That means uh, you know, every seventh base pair here is wrong. That, that is quite confusing to me, and I would certainly be hesitant to use this data. Now, you might think these are extreme cases, um, and especially as uh, the way we group them. So the data set in your lower right, uh, right hand corner is an extreme case in that the FRED scores are very, very low, but the error scores that we see with uh, DRISI are actually very high. Unfortunately, the situation that presents to, to us as the MGRAS team is that we frequently see data sets that have very low FRED scores, but we have a, a lot of problems sort of interpreting the data. And once we run our DRISI score, what we find is that uh, we see a correlation between our ability to analyze data and the DRISI score. So, what we are assuming at this time, we haven't studied this systematically, is that vendors are, are under-reporting errors with their FRED scores. And when I mention this to vendors, uh, they're not sort of starting to yell at me. They're actually just, uh, basically, they, they get quiet a lot. At this. Looking at errors is really important. This is Illumina. So what you can see here is not platform dependent. It seems to be library dependent and also uh, dependent on the people uh, running it. Uh, I can show you the same, same error uh, reports for other platforms, but they're not always as nice. Uh, 
uh, I'll leave it at that. This is not about bashing vendors, but it's certainly a problem that researchers are uh, doing this kind of work without being familiar with the error profile, I would say. And as a researcher, I would really like to know if my data is, you know, one of the, the top ones here, and so it's relatively, relatively okay from a sequence quality point of view, or am I down here, or maybe the error profile of my sequence data is even worse, in which case I will have problems, you know, computing annotations, predicting genes, or even running assembly. And I think uh, I know very few people who are systematically looking at their data and not making the assumption that the data is good and then just working from there. So this is one of the big challenges. We have to find a good way of running quality control across many data sets to ensure that we're not actually looking at artifacts. And I know quite a few studies, and I'm not going to go into detail there, where they looked at sequencing artifacts instead of uh, biological uh, you know, phenomena. Okay, the other big challenge, I think, is the annotation. And uh, this is uh, something that is best illustrated, by, I think, by uh, the two diagrams shown here. So the diagram on the right-hand side I stole from Rob Knight. This is showing the development of sequencing costs, which I think isn't too scary, right? It's just a linear drop. No, wait, it isn't linear because our axis here is actually exponential. So what we're seeing is we're seeing a dramatic drop in sequence generation costs which is good. It means everybody has access to sequencing. The new platforms are making that real easy. The big problem, though, is that the cost for doing analysis, shown in the diagram on the, on the left-hand side, is changing rather dramatically. So we have, uh, and this is actually from 2009, where we took some uh, 454 and Illumina data. So this is for the 454 platform, GS Flex, for the GA2X, which was the uh, state-of-the-art Illumina platform at the time, platform at the time and high seq 2000 data. So what we did is we took a typical run, a typical uh, run at the time, was generating about a half a gigabase shown here for 454, took two runs of 454, uh, and then we looked at the, uh, the analysis uh, cost compared to the sequencing cost. And the analysis costs were obtained by running BlastX on the Amazon uh, Cloud EC2 platform. And people will point out, and this is correct, that BlastX is the right algorithm for doing this. And uh, the other comment I, I want to make is that Amazon's prices have dropped significantly. But the trend is still true. Amazon prices were, Amazon's prices were cut in half. Uh, one of the things I want to point out looking at this diagram is that sequencing costs are very interesting because they're more or less stable across platforms. So a run, it's like buying a laptop. A run is almost always the same cost. So here the run is $15,000 and analyzing the 454 run using BlastX on EC2 is about $3,500. That is expensive, but nobody really would have a problem. Because you might argue that, yeah, I can do that more cheap on my, or much cheaper on my cluster, which is somewhat true because you're not paying the cost. But let me remind you, Amazon is very, very, very good at running computers inexpensively. I know of no other organization that can run computers cheaper than Amazon. And yes, they're making a profit, but it still typically is a lot cheaper than what you pay real cost in the organization. So this gets a problem not with 454 because the data yield is pretty low, but it gets, gets to be a problem once we start looking at either GA2X or more inter interestingly the high seek. And I, I should point out to you that at the time we thought the high seek yield per uh, run would be uh, on the order of 100 gigabases, which of course we all know these days it is not true. It's actually 600 gigabases. So what I would encourage you to do is multiply the number you see here by six, and suddenly your sequencing cost of $15,000 will lead to uh, a staggering number of dollars you need to spend for analysis costs if you run BlastX. This is all a phenomenon of what uh, you, and, uh, you and Bernie and also Guy Cochran from the EBI refer to as living on the log scale. And I think one of the, the things we need to be, become aware of as a discipline is that the analysis costs are going to be A, far outweighing uh, sequencing costs. So we have to be very careful what we analyze and how we analyze it. But also, this is a growing, this is a continuing phenomenon. These costs will not actually improve. They will actually get worse over time. Since Moore's law will lead to a reduction of cost by a factor of 100% every 18 months, sorry, a reduction of cost by a factor of 50% every 18 months, but it will, uh, it will sort of happen at the same time when sequencing gets cheaper by a factor of 10 every year. So we have a really big dilemma here, something that we have to find strategies to solve, and they're not impacting the other biological disciplines as badly as they're impacting metagenomics, because in resequencing, the algorithms are much, much more efficient. Uh, at this time. Metagenomics is very much reliant on matching to the database, J uh, NCBI's non-redundant protein database, and this is very frequently still done by algorithms like BlastX that are very expensive computationally, and this will lead to this cost of not, you know, $300,000, but actually $1.8 million for uh, a single uh, high seek run this time. This is not something I think that most budgets will easily have room for. So when we do that, we characterize genes or features, as I like to call them, 
we actually not only want to run a single search against a single database, GenBank or the uh, NR, the non-redundant protein representation of GenBank is what people typically search against. Many people are looking for alternative databases. So in addition to running BLAST against GenBank, which was what we've done in the, in the previous slide, they also want to run against Go, search, search for AC numbers in CAC, look for COX, run it against the seed database, run it against strings. So this is very, very hard computationally. And the uh, results, of course, are very useful. As Bob mentioned, we can get functions. We can get EC numbers, allowing us to create metabolic models. Some people are, uh, use Go numbers, although I find them less useful for metagenomes than, in fact, for all prokaryotic organisms. We can also derive taxonomic information from them. And as Bob was mentioning, people not only use BLAST, they also routinely use even more costly algorithms applying hidden Markov models to that. So that doesn't really scale well because one of the things I have to remind you of, this is not something you do once. You will end up doing that multiple times in the course of your project. What you will also end up doing at most, most uh, frequently at the moment when your paper suddenly uh, is seen by a reviewer, the reviewer says, how does your data compare to somebody else's data? And, and you're forced to reanalyze everything and, again, go through not only your own computations, but also compute analysis of somebody else's data, which, again, makes it way more expensive because suddenly you're not only paying the computational analysis cost for your own data, you're also paying that for somebody else's data. So there's a lot of algorithms around BLAST or BLASTX. It's, it's, it's definitely the default algorithm right now. The list is by far not exhaustive. BLAST is significantly too expensive. I've shown you the numbers. There are other algorithms, for example, BLAT, uh, something that was developed in the context of the Human uh, Genome Project many a couple of years ago, actually almost 10 years ago. Well tested, it's not parallel. It's, you lose a bit of sens sensitivity. That is, you don't find the, the distant homologs that you might find with BLAST, or you can certainly also find with HMM. But the problem here is that um, the question ha has to be asked, can we actually afford searching for those? Of course, there are new algorithms like RepSearch2 from Eugene uh, Jens Lab in Indiana that are emerging, but those haven't been tested. There's a number of, of tricks using uh, what is called a suffix array. Uh, they're very fast, but they don't allow any mismatches, which of course is really bad in a situation where we have errors. So there are lots of problems around. I think in summary, what we can say is similarity searching cost is very high. We will need to do repeat searches. Just imagine something like Nikos Kripides uh, Microbial Earth Project, which is aiming to sequence 10,000 complete microbial genomes, is hitting the databases. You cannot, as the EMP or even as an individual researcher, you cannot ignore the importance of, of those 10,000 sort of reference genomes. So you will have to rerun your searches. It means you have to pay the price again. So this is a very interesting and very hard problem for the community to solve. We are basically confronted with a uh, situation where we will have uh, have to perform updates basically every six months, I believe, of most uh, of the major metagenomes that are used by the community. So that's a big problem. But the biggest problem I, I think at this time for something like the Earth micro, uh, Microbiome Project is actually data access. If you were a researcher right now, you're on this call and I asked you, hey, could you help me analyze something from the Human Microbiome Project, which already has a lot more data out there? And I told you that the raw data for the uh, Human Microbiome Project right now is about six terabase pairs. So this is six times 10 to the 12 bases. Would you be able to download that? And if I told you that the, uh, the disk, the file on disk, it's actually typically uh, larger than the six terabases. It's actually typically uh, the multiply, multiply is four. So you'd have to download more than 20 terabytes. Most people aren't equipped to do that. They couldn't even transport the sequences. If I told you that we've actually analyzed the, uh, the Human Microbiome Project with MGRAS and the total product size that includes all our annotation, all these immediate data products, is in a compressed format. It's more than 40 terabytes you would find it very hard to, to take that data and download that data. And that just indicates that at the community, people in bio aren't used to handling big data objects. And this is certainly different to, let's say, the physics community, where people are very experienced handling that. So we as a community have to learn these things. It starts with data transport. It starts with include certainly provenance information. We have to make sure that we when we compute something, we have to provide exact parameters. Where was it computed? What was the database? All of these things because the other researchers that are working in the field will not have the money to rerun the searches. And of course, how do you transport the results? Where, where are they stored? These are still open questions. These are questions that the Earth Microbiome Project will have to be uh, able to, to provide answers for. And I think for all of this to work, we have to sort of work with the community to get their input. We need to be open. We need to be extensible. Uh, we need to be extensible. But the important thing is we have to provide a solution in the next couple of years or else the community will be really stuck. 
from my point of view, what's helping us is that users typically don't want to download all of the uh, human microbiome project, or in this case, in our case, all of the Earth microbiome project uh, data. They are typically interested in a very small subset. So we believe that the solution that we will find for the community in the long run needs to be something where you as a researcher can say, I'm interested in all reads that are mapping to E. coli from the human microbiome project. Is there a tool that allows me to download these? And then I can perform my work in-house on, on a subset of that. And suddenly I don't have to download you know, 40 terabytes of data, which is uh, significant, significantly larger than what most people's storage infrastructure will yield easily. It certainly can be done, it's very hard. Just, and by the way, downloading 40 terabytes is uh, not something you can do in a day for, for uh, most operations, most, most groups. It'll typically take a week or even a couple of weeks. Let me quickly go to the end, because I wanted to end uh, with a quick look at MGRAS. Let me do that very quickly. So I wanted to point people at the uh, MGRAS project. It's our homepage showing that we have done more than 30 terabytes, uh, 13 terabytes. The URL is up here. One of the features of MGRAS is we are hosting a set of projects. So you can uh, sort of search for things. I am searching here for the Human Microbiome Project which is a big project, as you can see, 1,600 metagenomes are in it. For every metagenome, we compute an overview page, which has a detailed report on the data. We, uh, most importantly, we, we report on the QC, the quality control. In this case, you can see that about 43% of the reads in the project fail QC. Many of them were annotated. Quite a few of them are, are just unknown. We report lots of metadata as it is available. This is certainly a problem with the HMP. Not a lot of metadata is available. We provide uh, functional breakdowns. Uh, down here, we also provide uh, taxonomic breakdowns, and there's a lot of other analysis functions that are available. We uh, make this stuff available. And the, the MGRAS system also provides analysis tools. You can uh, generate bar charts, trees, tables, heat maps, uh, principal component or coordinate analyses, uh, or rarefaction curves across many data sets. And there is an R client available as well that lets you talk to the system. And with that, I would like to thank you for your attention. Thank you very much, Volker. Great presentation as always. Our third and final presenter for today's webinar is Laura Parfrey, a postdoc at, postdoctoral research associate in chemistry and biochemistry at the University of Colorado in Boulder. Her research in Rob Knight's lab, Rob is one of the undoubted leaders in uh, the world of metagenomics, research focuses on incorporating eukaryotes into microbial community analyses to elucidate community structures. With her colleagues, Laura has established the Eukaryotic Taxonomy Working Group to improve microbial database classification. Laura, great pleasure to have you. Welcome, and uh, the microphone is yours. All right. Thanks, Kevin and Elizabeth. So I'm working with Rob Knight at, at the University of Colorado. And so the, the Knight Lab in general works on, on the Human Microbiome Project and Earth Microbiome and bacterials and microbial diversity all over the place. And um, my role is really about bringing eukaryotes into that. So as we've heard a, heard a lot already, uh, microbes matter a lot. And just this is a summary slide saying that they matter because of sheer numbers. There's 10 times more microbial cells and 100 times more microbial genes on average. What's been really exciting in the past uh, five or 10 years is the realization that our microbes matter because they influence our lives in lots of different ways. So they, microbes make mice fat. So if you, take, you can make a mouse fat in different genetic ways by knocking out different genes. Um, so this, but you can t also take the microbes, and the microbes are different between lean and obese of mice and humans as well. You can take the microbes from an obese mouse, put it in a genetically normal lean mouse, and it will actually become obese as well because it's hungrier, basically. It eats more food. Microbes influence mating behavior, they influence uh, our, our brains and our behavior, as well as the way we metabolize drugs and lots and lots of other human biology, aspects of human biology. As Volker was talking about, we really live on a microbial planet. So microbes are the dominant component of biodiversity, they're dominant in biomass. But really most of these insights into microbes and their importance has been derived from archaea and bacteria. So my focus has been looking at the other domain, the, the eukaryotes, and what can we learn if we include them as well. Some of the motivations are, from a human health perspective, they're a major source of morbidity and mortality, especially in parts of the world where sanitation is a problem. And they also allow us to start taking a, a deeper look into trophic dynamics. So we can look at ecological roles that eukaryotes often play, such as predation, parasitism, and, and get a better overall picture of, 
of these microbial communities and what they're doing. So, and we also, we know that eukaryotic microbes influence their hosts in, in lots of ways. Yeah, well, They're just two fun examples yeah. um, from the popular press recently. So if, if these tropical ants, they're normally all black, but when they're infected with nematodes, the nematodes lay lots and lots of eggs in the, in the abdomen. Because of the behavioral change in the ants, and they go up onto high leaf surfaces, stick their, their abdomen up in the air, and the abdomen turns bright red, so now it looks like a berry, and it, birds are attracted to it, they take it off and a great way for the nematodes to disperse themselves in the environment, although not so great for the ants. Closer to home, Toxoplasma gondii, an AB complex and parasite, does similar things in rats. So when Toxoplasma infects rats, it moves to the brain and actually changes the brain chemistry of the rat. So the rat becomes, instead of being afraid of cats and of and repulsed by cat urine, moving away from cat urine, it actually becomes attracted to cat urine and becomes more like a sex pheromone. So the rat goes towards the cat, which isn't so good for the rat, but then the toxoplasma is transferred to the cat when it eats it and um, is really great for the toxo because it's now in its definitive host. So, so we have lots of examples of how eukaryotic microbes are directly manipulating manipulating their host and they're playing a large role in, in host biology and in communities in general. And just as a back to human health perspective, parasites are really important to consider uh, globally because we know that they have a large impact on the overall cognitive ability of humans. So this is from a recent paper in the Proceedings of Royal Society. Epic et al. graphed the overall national IQ versus uh, parasite load or um, Infectious, infectious disease in general. And they see a really striking trend. Um, the higher uh, infectious disease load you have, the lower the average national IQ. So this, these have, this concept has really major impacts worldwide. But I just want to also remind you that not everything eukaryotic in the, in the gut or host associated is a parasite or a pathogen. There are lots of beneficial microbes. We know most about them from organisms that eat a lot of cellulose, such as termites and ruminants, where eukaryotes are some of the dominant organisms breaking down cellulose and, provide, and converting that into to food source for those animals. But it's quite clear that, that most of the eukaryotes in the human gut will also be either commensal or in the, are certainly beneficial ones as well. We want to better understand host-associated eukaryotes, but put those within a context of broader eukaryotic diversity because that's actually my, my background is in looking at eukaryotic systematics of the approach that I generally take. And so just to remind you what um, our views of, of the structure of the tree of life and the eukaryotic tree of life has been, historically there's been an emphasis placed on macroscopic groups. So this is a five, the five kingdom system that came out in the uh, 60s and 70s and really remains a, a part of popular culture. Um, so you had the, the five groups were plants, animals, fungi, all of the microbial eukaryotes were looped in the, lumped into the protista, not all the bacteria in the monera. And so this is really what you see when you walk outside, but it's not an accurate picture of what eukaryotic diversity looks like. And you can see that if you plot these four eukaryotic groups onto your current best guess of what the eukaryotic tree of life looks like. So plants and animals um, and fungi are just a couple of lineages within the vast diversity of microbial eukaryotes. And so this is a much more rep accurate representation of what eukaryotic diversity looks like. There's tons of different morphological forms, um, but most of it's microbial, and uh, there's lots of interesting stuff going on here. And so that's the representation on the eukaryotic tree. So this huge amount of diversity, uh, how do we assess that? Um, and just, just like in bacteria, about 99% of eukaryotic microbes are also not culturable. So we are definitely going with sequencing approaches as well. And also like bacteria, ribosomal DNA is universally present in eukaryotes. It provides a great mix of conserved and variable regions, so you can design primers, but also distinguish groups at shallow taxonomic levels. And so here we're targeting small subunit ribosomal DNA, also called 18S for eukaryotes, which is analogous to 16S in, in bacteria. And as Volker pointed out, the problem 
in assessing diversity is now not so much sequencing, which is getting quite cheap, but it's how to analyze and extract meaningful patterns from the vast amounts of data that are coming in now. And so um, in Rob's lab, there has been a major push to generate an, an open source and freely available uh, software platform for taking the sequence data as it, in the raw state off, straight off the sequencing machine and uh, running all sorts of analyses on that to look at uh, diversity of communities and the important factors that are structuring those communities all the way to publication quality plots that you can use. And so that's Chime or Quantitative Insights into Microbial Ecology. Here's the, the website for it, and it is uh, well supported and freely available in, in open source. Chime is also, Chime is, was developed for using 16S data for bacteria, but it also works really well with 18S. And Tony Walters in the lab has, has a tutorial for using Chime for 18S data on the um, website that you can find. And just I'm going to walk you through a really brief overview of what we do in the lab with analyzing lots and lots of samples at once. So we have to analyze hundreds of thousands of, of sequences per sample, and we do that by using uh, primers that have barcodes in them so we can distinguish samples in, informatically later. Mix those samples and sequence them on 454 or Lumina or PacBio or um, name your platform here. And then uh, those sequences are separated based on barcode into the samples they came from. And then we do a lot with phylogenetic trees and really extract all the rich information that you can get out of phylogenetic relationships and turn that information into various plots so we can assess the factors that are driving and structuring these communities in the samples. Some factors that are specific to incorporating eukaryotes into these analyses, obviously we have different different primers, and uh, if, if you're interested in them, there are some primers that are used, being used for the EMP as well that uh, we can make available. There's a lot of infrastructure that's gone on in developing the databases. Is the database that's normal, that's really widely used for 16S, Green Gene doesn't have eukaryotes involved, neither does RDP, so we're using Silva, and we're working really closely with the developers of the Silva database, especially Pelman, Yilma, and uh, Frank Oliver, to, to create a representation of the classification that really satisfies taxonomists, but also works well in a computational sense. And so that should be released later this summer with a more compre a comprehensive taxonomy of, of eukaryotes in the Silva database that, works, that interfaces really nicely with Chime. On to the data part of the talk. So one of the main starting questions is what constitutes a normal eukaryotic microbiome? This question's been pondered for a long time. Who lives in the gut? Starting with Leeuwenhoek back in the uh, 1600s, he took a sample of his own species, put it under his, the microscope he developed, and he has the first drawings of, of microbial eukaryotes there. He saw Giardia and thought it was a really, really pretty creature moving um, much more intricate patterns in the bacteria. Um, and from there, we've just described lots and lots of diversity of, of eukaryotes that are found in the gut. These, these are just some examples. And so one of the places that I started was comparing the overall patterns of, of diversity in the gut and host-associated environments with what's been found in bacteria, because the work in bacteria is much more advanced. We know a lot more about the bacterial communities. And so the overall broad patterns of diversity that are seen in bacteria is that there are just a few lineages of bacteria that are host associated. So there are many, many more lineages that are found in free living environments like water and soil, but just a few have made the jump to host associated environments. Crucially, the, the, the ones that do make the jump are really successful. So we see the same lineages that are found across lots of different vertebrate and animal taxa. For example, I'm sure you all have heard that the Firmicutes and Bacteroidetes are the dominant uh, phylum level diversity in across vertebrates. And then we also see a lot of shallow level or strain and species level diversification. So again, the, the things that have successfully colonized host associated environments, and especially the gut, have been really successful for bacteria. So when we look in um, the eukaryotes, here's a representation of the eukaryotic tree of life that 
represents very broadly all those microbial lineages plus plants, animals, and fungi. Um, and if we color the lineages that are found in, in either vertebrates or non-vertebrate animals, we can see that there is quite a patchy distribution. So again, there's many more lineages that are free living, these black ones here, that are never found associated with um, animal hosts. So we see a patchy distribution of lineages. And um, just like in bacteria, we see the same lineages popping up in different animal hosts. So we have the same um, pair of cellids related to Trichomonas daginalis that are found in both in both humans and they're a major component of the gut community or the hindgut community in, in termites as well. Um, same with Blastocystis, which you know, can have the same strain found across mammals. And so we're really seeing similar patterns of diversity here. Same with Entamoeba. Um, we don't see as much strain or species level diversification, um, but there, but we do see overall common patterns in eukaryotes as we did in bacteria. So we're looking at, uh, so that's a, based on a literature review of, of lineages that are known based on microscopy studies. When we move to incorporating primers, so this is actually using 454 Flex Plus in collaboration with Roche. Um, so the data from a 600 base pair Amplicon primers that Tony Walters in the lab designed using another open source free software package developed uh, by Tony, Primer Prospector. And uh, this is just a, a, a survey of eukaryotic communities in a wide range of host associated environments and free living environments. So we have about equal numbers of each. We have human mouse and fecal samples and some diverse mammal fecal samples as well and then a lot of different free living environments. So like I said, we like to do a lot of things here in the night lab in a phylogenetic context. So if we take all of those representative sequences from, from that broad survey and place it into this broadly representative eukaryotic tree of life from a paper I did in 2010, and we can do this in, in another software package developed in lab by Meg Pruning. Topiary Explorer. So you can place all those sequences in there. So we have fun, fungi and animals up here. It's another re relevant group. You can color by the environment where those samples, where those sequences were isolated from. So red is host associated, blue is environmental. And what you can see is a really clear pattern that again we have a very patchy distribution and many fewer lineages that are in host associated environments compared to free living soil and water environment. And so we can also do a quantitative assessment of this diversity, either using major measures of ecological diversity, alpha diversity of species, richness and evenness, so really who's there and in what proportions. And then we can, looking at beta diversity, just the differentiation of alpha diversity is uh, different samples across those samples and across communities. And for both of these approaches, we were taking advantage of phylogenetic information. And so the results of, of that analysis are that if we look at alpha diversity in a uh, phylogenetically informed metric, we see that environmental samples have much higher diversity than host associated samples. And that's not surprising. That's exactly what we saw when we placed them into that tree. If we look at beta diversity, and so this is just setting you up for what we expect based on bacteria. For bacteria, there was a clear differentiation between the environmental samples from a very wide range of environments and host-associated samples. These were mostly um, vertebrate gut samples. So there's really two distinct uh, patterns that we're seeing for bacteria. We do a, a beta diversity plot for eukaryotes. We do still see host-associated cluster up here, but we don't, don't see that sharp differentiation. So there's a lot of toxic are samples down here that are actually intermingled with environmental samples. And we get a clue to why that might be if you plot the taxa that are driving these beta diversity patterns onto that tree or onto this um, PCOA plot. And what you can see is the samples that are very distinct here are, they have uh, flagship members that are, that are unique to host associated environments, such as the Entamoeba, Blastocystis, the Parapathalids. And, but there are a lot of host-associated communities that don't actually have those indicator taxa, that they're really dominated by fungi and other things like that that are also found in the environment. So that's what we're seeing. So 
the patterns in, in eukaryotes are driven by these indicator taxa, this host-restricted taxa. And we don't see that sharp distinction we did in bacteria. And so uh, it's just the broad conclusion so that, that overall, when we consider the total diversity of, of eukaryotes across lots of different host associated samples, we see that the pa patterns really mirror what we found in bacteria. The, the patchy distribution, a few lineages that are successful in host associated environments, and they're found in lots of different vertebrate and um, other invertebrate animal taxa. We still don't really know what's normal because there is a, a, a patchy distribution across individuals, so not all people have those indicator taxa. And then in work I didn't talk about, we're also using long reads in collaboration with Roche to get more um, taxonomic res resolution in medically important clades. And I think with this, we're really poised to gain a lot of new insights into stress associated communities in health and disease by now with this infrastructure being able to incorporate eukaryotes into a lot of different microbial community analyses. And this isn't just restricted to host associated environments. Um, definitely, it's a uh, there's a lot of interest in incorporating eukaryotes into a broader scale analysis of environmental communities from free living environments as well. And with that, I'd just like to uh, thank a lot of funding sources and um, people in the lab that, it, that have contributed to this work, um, and especially Rob Knight, the PI on, on these investigations. Thank you very much. Laura, thank you so much. Uh, great presentation and a great way to round out today's webcast. We have reached the end of the broadcast, so the enthusiasm of our speakers was evident. Uh, we've, we've run about 30 minutes over time. So a couple of uh, closing announcements uh, here. Thank you to everybody who submitted questions. We'd love to take them all now. Uh, in light of the time, I won't do that, but what we will do is post all of the questions and the responses that we have uh, received uh, from the, uh, some of the speakers online at NGS Leaders. We'll send you a link to everybody on the call uh, so that you know where exactly where to go. It'll be in the discussion forum at ngsleaders.org in the next day or two. And uh, we trust that there will be um, that not only the speakers, but anyone else with a, an opinion on addressing those specific co conferences, uh, those questions can, uh, can uh, address. Uh, we have contact information for our three speakers. So if you did have a specific question for any of our three presenters, uh, you can reach Barbara, Volker, or Laura at the emails that you see uh, online there. A couple of closing announcements uh, just before we sign off here. Uh, we have a couple of uh, uh, exciting conferences coming up from our partners at uh, Cambridge Health Tech Institute uh, and BioIT World. Uh, the Clinical Genome Conference takes place in San Francisco in June. Uh, the first uh, a debut conference looking at the impact of uh, whole genome sequencing in the clinic. And then uh, our regular NGX applying next-gen sequencing conference will be in Providence, Rhode Island. Uh, this meeting has traditionally been held in late September, uh, but we've brought it forward uh, to uh, to the middle of August. Uh, so uh, please look at the programs for both of those meetings if they're of interest. Uh, you'll find the, the URLs uh, there at healthtech.com. So with that, so we've reached the end of the 90 minutes. I want to thank our three speakers, uh, Barbara Mefe, Volker Meyer, and uh, Laura Parfrey for three excellent presentations. I hope you've enjoyed this uh, introduction of sorts into the world of microbiome analysis. I think given the fact that we had almost 300 people on the call. This is definitely a topic that we will revisit in the near future. And if you have specific ideas for what topics you would like to see discussed in this format, uh, please, please send them along to us. We'd love to get your, your input. So on behalf of uh, our speakers and uh, everyone who put the uh, broadcast together, uh, and my thanks again to all of you for, for joining us today. And we hope to see you again at NGS Leaders for another webinar in the near future. Thanks to everybody. Bye-bye for now.